Welcome to the 22nd video on Ancient Rome and part two on Carthage. Now in this video we're going to look at the armed forces of Carthage. Now I also promised in the last video we were going to look at the government as well. But I'm actually going to tie that into the next video when we get to the start of the Punic Wars. And I promise we will actually get to the start of the Punic War in the next video. But in this video, as I said, we're going to take a look at the military of Carthage. Now, as many of you probably already know, the Carthaginian armies were largely composed of mercenary troops. And these troops were incorporated from the different areas that Carthage conquered. So we see troops from North Africa, Spain, and parts of Gaul. And of course we know this is different from Rome, which was composed mainly of citizen soldiers. Now the hiring of professional soldiers applied to both the land army and navy, but there was a unit called the Sacred Band, and they were composed of citizens, and these would have been wealthy citizens, and as a result they could afford the best gear and equipment. Now you might ask, well, why weren't a majority of the citizens involved in the military of Carthage? And the reason was time. The citizens were more engaged with the lucrative trade and commerce that Carthage enjoyed, and so many citizens just didn't have the time for military duty. And so Carthage had to rely on professional soldiers. Now, as I said, the ranks were filled by most of Carthage's allies, and this included the Numidians, Libyans, and Iberians. Numidians supplied some of the finest light cavalry in the world, and we'll get to that in a few slides. Now, this was more a symbiotic relationship. The Carthaginians didn't necessarily force their allies to contribute troops, they paid them. And so they were not only paid, but they could also participate in the war booty during the Carthaginian campaigns. And so some of Carthage's allies became very wealthy as a result of their relationship with Carthage. So let's first take a look at the infantry of Carthage. Now Carthage used the Greek phalanx as their primary military formation. The Libyans made up the heavy infantry, and so they would have carried a spear and a heavy shield, a lot like the heavy infantry in the Greek phalanx. The Spanish made excellent swordsmen, and the Gauls were used as irregular formations, and so they were good for shock charges. Now, often the heavy infantry led first with the Spanish swordsmen in support. Now, as I said, the elite unit in the heavy infantry was the Sacred Band, and these were the sons of Carthaginian nobles, and so again, they were citizens. And as a result of their wealth, they could afford the best equipment. Now, this unit checked in at around 2,500 hoplites, but the Sacred Band really only formed a small portion of the army. It was the Libyans and the other mercenary troops that formed the bulk of of the Carthaginian army. And over time, the sacred band would get smaller and smaller in size. And so there was this tendency on Carthage to rely more and more on mercenary soldiers. Now, the best of the mercenary land troops were the Iberians and the Libyans. Now, the Iberians you will also see referred to as the Spanish. But there really wasn't a concept of the Spanish during those times. They were simply referred to as the Iberians. And so when Carthage went to war, they would request these various nations send troops. But the major difference, as I said, they were paid. So it's somewhat similar to Persia, where Persia didn't necessarily use citizens, they would assemble mercenary troops under a bunch of different nations, and they would all be assembled under one banner. So again, it's very, very similar to uh, the Persian Empire in some regards. Now, the overall leadership was always under the direction of a Carthaginian general, and he would have been a citizen. Now, there might have been some allied generals that were in control of operations, but they always answered to a Carthaginian general who again was a citizen. Now in terms of using mercenaries there are pros and cons like there is to everything. The benefits of using mercenary soldiers is that they are pros. You are getting a professional army. They do not need to be trained and of course it takes time to train citizen soldiers but with mercenaries you get an army that's good to go. The problem is though when the pay runs out they will go find another war to fight. And it might not necessarily be on behalf of the city that they were originally hired out to. So they are not loyal to the city, they are loyal to the general. But that loyalty can run very, very far. 
I mean, if we take a look at Hannibal's crossing of the Alps, those were some of the worst conditions that any army has ever had to suffer, and yet they were willing to continue on with that trek, even though the Carthaginian army under Hannibal suffered massive casualties. And so, as I said, they had extreme loyalty to Hannibal, not necessarily to Carthage, but to Hannibal as the general. Now let's take a look at the cavalry formations of the Carthaginian army. Now the cavalry consisted of light and heavy formations. And as was the standard in ancient times, the cavalry was usually posted on the wings of the main army. Now the best cavalry in the Carthaginian army were the Numidians. The Numidian cavalry was irregular in its formation, and for the most part, the Numidians were unmatched on the battlefield. And as you can see in that drawing on the right, they possessed several javelins which they could lob at the enemy. And the Numidians, for the most part, were all about speed. They were primarily skirmishers. And so their main objective was to keep the enemy cavalry away from the main Carthaginian army. Now, because of this speed, the Numidians could conduct fast skirmishes to break up the Roman ranks, and so they might tear into the formation and launch some of these javelins, and then turn around and retreat, and then come back again and lob another javelin at the Romans, and that was very disorientating to the Romans, who at this time were used to stand up fighting. Now, after the Numidians were done whatever it is they were doing, the Carthaginians would follow this up with an attack using their heavy cavalry, and this might be the Sacred Band or the Libyan heavy cavalry. Calvary. Now, the Numidians were not just excellent skirmishers, they were fantastic scouts, and they could provide critical intelligence to the Carthaginian general on the enemy movements. And Hannibal would often use the speed of the Numidians to lure the Romans into a trap. Now, as we know, the Carthaginians also possessed African war elephants, and these were used to break up the enemy ranks before the Carthaginian infantry and regular cavalry attacked in earnest. And so they were pretty much a terror weapon. And a lot of times, the enemy cavalry would flee at the mere sight of these gigantic beasts. And of course there is the famed Carthaginian navy. Now up until around the 8th century BC, warships had a very very simple design. They basically had a set of oars on each side. Now the tactics were still the same, you still wanted to ram the enemy ship, but as I said there was a limited amount of oars. Then there was a technological advance called the bireme, and you can see an example of this on the bottom left. Now the bireme added two banks of oars, and then there was yet another Another technological advance called the trireme, and you guessed it, that had three banks of oars. And that was kind of the default ship used by many different navies during ancient times. And you can see this diagram here on the right. There are three banks of oars, and that makes up the trireme. And so Carthage possessed numerous triremes. And you will also notice that there are two levels to the trireme. The bottom level has the first bank of rowers, and the top level has the next two banks of oars. And then another technological advance occurred, and that was a vessel type called the Quincareme. Now that also contained three banks of oars, so it would have looked similar to the trireme, except they doubled up on the two top banks of oars. So the ratio would have been two here, two here, and one here. And so it was a 2 2 1 relationship, giving you 5, which of course relates to the name Quincream. And what do more rowers give you? Well, that gives you more speed. And what does more speed give you? That gives you more ramming potential. And so the Quincream was the ultimate ramming ship during ancient times. And Carthage possessed numerous Quincreams. They were also heavier than triremes, so they were not as vulnerable to choppy seas. And that meant they could ram with much greater accuracy than the triremes. Now, if you had a squadron that consisted of triremes and quincaremes, it was usually the quincareme that was out in front, leading the charge. And they could ram a ship and take out a ship in a single strike. They were that powerful. Now, in terms of the composition of the crew, rowers constituted about 75% of the ship's crew. The ships were also commanded by naval officers, who were under the control of an overall general, who probably was also in charge of the army. So somebody like Hamilcar Barca would have had control of both the land and sea forces, and ultimately they answered to the Carthaginian Senate. But the relationship between general and senate was complicated, and we'll talk about that in future videos. Now, during most of Carthage's history, the navy was the most important wing of the Carthaginian armed forces, and so it was much larger than the army. 
Carthage's main competition before the Punic Wars were the Greek city-states in Sicily, especially Syracuse. Now, Polybius will tell us that 350 Carthaginian ships could be put to sea, and these were manned by 150,000 rowers and soldiers. And so it was one of the largest navies in ancient times. Okay, that is going to do it for this video. In the next video, we'll get to the start of the First Punic War.